37, 38. Bob and I were friends for 38 years. In 1976, I moved from Newcastle upon Tyne to Oakland, California to attend the Center for Contemporary Music. At that time, Bob was sharing the directorship with David Behrman. Cut to 2011. In the summer of 2011, I received an email message from Bob asking me if I would be interested in directing an opera of his from 1967 called That Morning Thing. Of course I said yes and put together the cast of 17 performers including Blue Jean Tyranny from the original performers, performances. And uh, you know a lot of people are familiar with Bob's music but they're not familiar with what a generous person he was and how supportive he was of other artists. The day after we finished the run at the kitchen in New York he sent a thank you message to everyone in the cast and I would like to read that, his own words. My dear dear friends, there are a lot of things to be said in my defense but I will spare you. This is just a short list of what I was so happy and grateful about. Thank you for sticking with me through those dark emotions and unexplainable things that seem to belong to the piece. I can't say how much I appreciate your understanding. Thank you for doing those unexplainable things so professionally. Thank you for not letting the dark stuff show in the way you treated the piece. You perfectly represented the ideas without any gnashing of the teeth. That is a kind of elegance that one could hardly have a right to expect. It was beautiful to watch and beautiful to hear. Thank you for getting better every day. Sometimes a performance builds to a feverish dress rehearsal followed by a day or so of letdown. You didn't let that happen. Every performance was better than what came before. The last performance was by far the best performance the piece has ever had. I couldn't expect a roaring review in the New York Times and so I was pleased in a way that Steve Smith said it was hard to understand. That's what it's about, it being hard to understand. Now I just have to figure out how to get us back together again. With love and admiration, Bob. To go full circle backwards, back to the Mills days in 1976, Bob proffered a lot of wise information and advice to everyone there. But the one that stuck with me was, he said, keep on doing what you're doing, and sooner or later, someone will pay you to do it. You were right, Bob. You were so right. Thank you, and I love you. 37. I fell in love with Bob Ashley's music when I was in high school. I heard a recording of Purposeful Lady Slow Afternoon and uh, remained very interested in him. And then when I went to grad school at Northwestern University, he came there one day in 1979 and with Blue Jean Tyranny gave the first complete performance of Perfect Lives. It was extremely exciting for me and I got to be his graduate assistant backstage technician, which I was very excited about. Uh, after that, I got the chance to see him every now and then for years and years. Um, interviewed him for the Village Voice a few times, which was always inspiring. And um, I was really impressed by Perfect Lives, and then Improvement came out, and I wanted it to be more like Perfect Lives, but eventually I realized it had its own kind of beauty, and then the same thing for Atlanta and Foreign Experiences and Dust. And I finally just realized he was going to reinvent himself with every new opera, and I quit, I, I quit expecting each one to be like the last. So, um, When University of Illinois asked me to write a book about an American composer, I almost immediately chose Bob, partly because I knew it was going to be so much fun interviewing him, and that it would give me an excuse to spend a lot of time with him while he was still here. We had, it was fantastic. Um, I would, his mind was perhaps the sharpest I've ever seen. He seemed to have some kind of total recall 
about his life and about his works. And I would ask a question, and he would close his eyes like this and start telling some seemingly unrelated story. And I'd sit there thinking, gee, maybe Bob's getting a little bit senile. But he would tell that story, and then he would tell another one, and then he'd tell another one, and 20 minutes later he would answer my question, and it, the answer required all of those stories before it would make any sense. It was the most amazing thing. I would ask uh, about the chord structure of, of one of his operas, and he'd just reach over and pick up the piece, piece of paper and hand it to me. He was incredibly organized inside and out. And he has always been such a, so buzzing with enthusiasm. Every time I've left Bob, I've been in a good mood. He just convinces you that everything, everything is possible. He was a great man. It's difficult to express how significant an impact, how great an influence one life can have on another. I will make an attempt, though it will be incomplete and inadequate. I had known of Robert Ashley's innovative music for years before beginning to work with him in 1980, first as a designer and subsequently as a performer. I admired his great intelligence and astonishing imagination. He was astoundingly prolific as well. Over the years, he became a North Star for me, an inspiration, a creative genius, and one of the best friends I've ever had. It was both an honor and a pleasure to have worked with Robert for so many years. Through his many operas, the ensemble toured internationally, were recorded and broadcast widely, and given the chance to perform the Vivid characters Robert created, so varied from opera to opera. Robert was incredibly generous in providing the many opportunities to all who worked with him for so many years, and we're all so very grateful and humbled by the experience. Robert had it all, grace, charm, wit, and a voice like velvet or smoke, depending on the character. He is already sorely missed. The world has lost one of the truly great ones. I'm very glad that you've decided to honor Robert Ashley with this honorary degree. Having worked with him for over 30 years, I'm convinced that his is the most original mind in contemporary music. He had a deep insight into the relationship between speech and music and set up operas that allowed his performers the maximum expression, spontaneous musical invention based on the declamation of the text, as he called it. He was, as he also often said of people he admired, one of the great ones. This video is very difficult for me to make. I've tried many times since I was asked and the sadness of his loss has made it extremely uh, upsetting. But I wanted to be able to participate in this because I admire him so much. Uh, I'm reminded of a line from one of his operas, happiness and sadness, they are permanently mixed. I'm Joan LaBarbera. I worked with Robert Ashley for nearly 40 years, starting in 1974 at a performance at the Musée d'Art Moderne in Paris, where I played a viola uh, lying in my lap, just dragging a bow across, um, making little ticks that activated a gating system that Robert had designed. I was also a member of the quartet that sang most of his operas with him, uh, including Dust, Concrete, Improvement, Now Eleanor's Idea, and many others. 
we've lost a major thinker, we've lost a magnificent composer, and a dear friend. I know that Robert would have been uh, very pleased and honored to receive the doctorate from your institution, and that he felt um, not sufficiently recognized for his work. Um, and I feel that uh, this honor meant a great deal to him. I wish that he could be here, certainly, to accept the honor in person, um, but know that it, it meant a great deal to him. I'm thinking that Bob actually just makes me smile. <laughs> I mean, I mean, yeah, yes, m m music is slow speech. <laughs> and, and thinking is how music smiles. Robert Ashley used to say that when Americans think about themselves, they face east to face the old world. Facing back towards Europe, gazing out towards the ocean, provides a reflection on distance, travel, and time. But when we're facing east from California, we face an empty void of deserts and endless stretches of cornfields. This disorientation, a losing of one's sense of east, may have been partly responsible for generating the multitude of new forms of American language and speech. Some of these speech forms were developed in the movie and television studios of California, while other forms of artful speech were born on format radio, crafted to sell commodities fast and hard to consumers. In reaching California, American consciousness and language lost significant parts of itself along the journey west. Above all, it lost its sense of history. In Ashley's operas, the characters speak in ways that makes familiar speech sound strange to our ears. The characters rant, chant, curse, and croon at the edges of the liminal. They tell other people's stories as their own or sing their own stories in unison with the group. They interrogate one another, interrupt, and then back each other up. Ashley and his band are always singing, but they can give the illusion that what they are doing is just some variety of speech. Illusion is the important part. Alvin Lucier wrote that Ashley turned speech into music. I think Bob did this through a kind of magic. Music reminds us that what enters our memory comes from another's memory. There is no thought without memory. All thoughts are kind of remembering in some way. And music is the way that we can tell a lot of stories, sometimes, all at the same time, and transport these stories into the minds of others. Robert Ashley believed that music wasn't fundamentally about sound, but about the presence of people. As a practice in being present, it is a sensorial opening to the world that is truly remarkable. Music is a way of being together, a way of thinking, a way of telling stories, a way of remembering, and a way of passing things on. Music and speech can produce ways of being in time and outside of time with one another. Being in time is where our voices and our stories are in harmony with each other. Being outside of time can occur while we're still in time. It happens when the rhythmic patterns produced by the voices or the musical accompaniment produce drones or circular times that make the stories seem to lift off the page, bringing us into the memories of the singers and the listeners simultaneously. That's Bob's great gift to us. He asks us to imagine another way of being together and gives us a new way of remembering what we thought we already knew. I've always loved the names of things out in those western deserts like the wait-a-minute bush, or last-chance mountain, or the funeral mountains. 
Most people would describe those deserts and the mountains that surround them as inhospitable. Death Valley in the Mojave Desert is the hottest place on earth. In summer, the temperature at the surface of the earth, that fragile, beautiful, ever so thin crust where earth meets sky, where all the life is happening, can reach 180 degrees Fahrenheit. Out in the Mojave, there lives the humble creosote bush. You wouldn't necessarily think so by looking at one, but Creosote bushes may be the longest living individuals on earth. There's a creosote bush in the Mojave Desert that's known to be 11,700 years old. So out there, where I've been going on my annual trance retreats for the last 12 years or so, my little camp might be home to a bush that's 10,000 years old. 10,000 years! And then along comes an idiot in his new four-wheel drive truck, fresh from the dealership, excited by his shift on the fly something. And a 10,000-year lifetime is over, just like that. In 1964, a graduate student was studying the old bristlecone pines that live in the mountains out there. He was taking cores with a drill tool and the bit broke. He cut down the tree to retrieve the broken part of his tool, and then he counted the rings. There were 4,844 of them. Later, it was determined that the tree had been 4,862 years old, and that graduate student had just killed the oldest tree on earth. That tree had survived the rise and fall of civilizations, the building of pyramids, cataclysmic upheavals, earthquakes, droughts, and floods to be killed by a graduate student retrieving his drill bit. And then there's the story of the 16-year-old girl that miraculously survived a recent plane crash in San Francisco, only to be killed when the rescue fire truck ran over her. Death always comes too soon, and it's always a surprise. Always. No kidding, man. Like Velikovsky. Abrupt. The myth has been modernized to sound scientific, that death is a release, a relief. But it's still just the same old myth, that when you die, everything is solved. The unison of left, right, and center, in all their variations, no more first before second. Music of the spheres, without weakness. The obsolescence of that concern. Everything connected. When if not now, who if not you? Death, eternal life. But don't jump to conclusions. <laughs>